Cairo, Seattle. It's time to get schooled with a professor, John Clayton. Welcome to Schooled with a Professor. I'm John Clayton. And of course, today's topic is going to be old style football. And who better to talk about it than Mike Ditka? Because Mike Ditka, I think, epitomized what it was like back in the old days, back in the 60s and the 70s, when the game was you know, very ferocious. I mean, it wasn't as publicized as it is now. I mean, you'd, you didn't have the TV angles and all the things you can see. But what you saw was guys that loved the game of football going out there and fighting through injuries, fighting through the simplicities of the game. You know, Back in the days when Mike Ditka was there, they didn't have situation substitution. I mean, you didn't have nickel packages and you didn't have that all you had was you look across the line at the other guy and you hit him hard and hit him often that was the way the game was and that's what's the great part you know seeing a guy like Mike Ditka because I think in so many ways he identifies what football in pro football is all about now I go back with him a long way just from the standpoint he grew up in Aliquippa PA which is a steel town way on the other side of where I grew up I grew up at Braddock PA and of course that was a steel town but the problem was you know steel started to you know lose its cloud as far as sales and so they were closing down mills and so both the areas became impoverished I mean it became very tough areas uh, employment was tough and living was tough I mean it was a ghetto where I was and it was pretty close to being a ghetto in Aliquippa even though uh, Mike was a little older than me and was able to see some of the some of the great times when uh, the area was there but that formed what it was in the appreciation for football because it's like, okay, football was big in Western Pennsylvania. And because of that, you know, you, you cared about the game. I mean, every Friday night I would be at a high school game someplace watching and Mike, of course, was playing and then not even thinking they was going to get into college. He went to Pitt. He was able to uh, come out of there. But what's great when you see a player like a Mike Ditka, I mean, there's so many guys that are so similar. I mean, the Ray Nitschkes and you know the guys that were just so tough. I mean, it's like they would just try to impose their physical will on you and Mike Ditka was just so good in the standpoint that you know a tight end position I mean basically you were a blocker I mean that's what you did you were that sixth offensive lineman but he was talented enough even though he wasn't fast but he was tenacious and you know he would get downfield and battle his way uh, against a linebacker and then catch some passes and then once he caught it boy it was fun to watch because I mean you know it was he was kind of like the offensive version of Dick Budkus, uh, his former teammate uh, with the Bears, in the sense that, you know, Budkus was that guy that would just run around and just clock you. And, uh, you know, Ditka was the one, if he caught the ball, he was looking like Marshawn Lynch. And that's why it's, it's funny because, uh, you know, everybody in this town misses the play of Marshawn Lynch. And Marshawn Lynch really was an old school player. I mean, he was basically a 70s fullback. And what I mean by a 70s fullback, I mean, like an Earl Campbell or even a Franco Harris, they were that big physical back. You know, it wasn't like they would sprint to the line of scrimmage and then bust through. I mean, they would look to kind of maneuver and see which way the angles are going to go and get that hit. But that's old school type of football. That's what Marshawn was able to bring. And that's why he was so good, because, you know, once he got past the line of scrimmage, I mean, he would try to you know angle for somebody and then just knock them down and make them pay a price if he was going to tackle them and then usually try to make them miss but that's the way that the the game of football was and it was you know it was a fun game and it's still a fun game now obviously because again everybody loves the game of football you can see you know ratings being good and television being good and you know the interest is just so high but uh, it was a little bit different back then I mean I back then in the 70s I still remember covering Steeler games where Terry Bradshaw or even Bob Greasy from the Miami Dolphins would be lucky to get more than 12 passes in a game I mean now you can go into series and you're going to have 12 passes in a series the way the game is and the way it's kind of gone above for the quarterbacks but really it wasn't a quarterback driven game in the 60s and 70s what it was was a game of physical play simple play Uh, Mike Ditko of course you know his being in Chicago I mean his biggest challenge was Green Bay I mean, because the Green Bay Packers were such a dynamic team and it had, uh, you know, Vince Lombardi as the coach. And you know how he would take the running plays and just try to keep running them and running them and running them. And if you couldn't stop them, you were going to lose and you're going to lose the physical battle. But, uh, you know, Mike was one that was able to do that. And what I love so much about a guy like a Mike Ditka, you know, coming out of Western Pennsylvania, going to Chicago, he really became, you know, the identity of 
of football in a town. I mean, you know, back in Pittsburgh, it was, you know, Jack Lambert. You know, it was uh, Joe Green. You know, in, in Chicago, it was, you know, Mike Didka because both he did it as a player and he did it as a coach. And, of course, once he took over the coaching reins, I mean, you really marveled at how well he was able to do it because, uh, you know, a lot of times you don't think – particularly physical players want to spend the time into coaching because, I mean, those days are long, those weeks are long. And, you know, they're, you know, you figure as a player, you're a celebrity and it's not really a big celebrity to be there at nine o'clock at night or even 12 midnight at night on a Tuesday night, preparing for a game and then getting ready for your next day's meetings. But, you know, Mike was able to go through that stuff. And then once he became a coach, I mean, he was able to put the identity that he had developed and the identity that Chicago wanted, which was having that big, physical tough team and certainly when you look at the 1985 Chicago Bears with all the characters that they had and how he was able to control that how he was able to control you know Buddy Ryan and uh, you know that defense and you know I still uh, still remember Buddy Ryan I remember him in 85 going into his office and saying how are you getting along with Mike Dick I says fine I give him his uh, game plan every Wednesday on defense and if he doesn't like it too bad it's like oh okay there would, there would be battles on the field and all that stuff but the great part is Mike was able to make it work and what he was able to do was teach the integrity of the game of football. And what I mean by the integrity of the game of football, that this is supposed to be physical and this is supposed to be one, you respect the game. I mean, and you try to, you know, deliver it the best effort you can on every play, which is the way that Mike Ditka's style was and really the style of that Chicago Bear team. But boy, that Chicago Bear team that he coached, what a wild team that was. You had the wild Jim McMahon at quarterback. I mean, you had the Super Bowl shuffle, which of course was a little bit of a problem because, you know, guys like Jim McMahon, they, they had agreed to do it, and some of the guys didn't want to do it. Walter Payton and Jim McMahon, for example, they wanted to back out of it, and then because they had signed a contract, you know, they had to come back and absolutely do it again. So that was one of the big challenges there, but Mike was able to make it all work, and when you see a defense that was that special and a team that was that special, you had Walter Payton, who was certainly one of the most uh, recognized and one of the most popular players in the history of the National Football League. That was great. A damn Hampton on the defensive line. You know, you had uh, Steve McMichael on the defensive line. You know, Mongo was out there just kind of going through, uh, just beating people up. But that was that was fun. But that was Mike Ditka football, and that was old school football. And, you know, it's funny now because here in this age when safety is such a big factor in how the game is changing and how they're taking away some of the hits, I mean, you know, the guys like Mike Ditka, and again, respecting the game, respect the safety issues, but still must be wondering. It's like, boy, they sure didn't do that back in those days. I mean, those are the days where, I mean, you would have two practices practices every day and they would be physical and they would be tough. I still remember going to Steeler practices in the seventies and usually they'd have about three or four guys getting dehydration from the amount of effort they had to put out in the practice field. Now that can't be done because of the way the collective bargaining agreement is. I mean, you only have a certain amount of time, a certain amount of things you can do, and you only have a certain number of days where you can really have the pads on. And that's the same thing during the season. I mean, you only have a certain number of times where you can put the pads on and prepare for the physical game where the players back in the Mike Ditka ages I mean they were out there every day two times a day and of course the money situation was such that you know they had to many of them go get second jobs I mean not be able to have the pay that was good enough that they could go hire a trainer and get ready for the season you know a lot of the guys would come to training camp and try to get back in shape in training camp but of course that's when training camps would be seven and eight weeks sometimes because you'd play six preseason games and those things would you know start in the early part of July or the middle of July and just go on forever but the idea was that you were going to physically beat your body into shape to be able to play. That was football then. It's a little bit different now, but it still remains a great physical game. And, you know, with Mike Ditka, he's always great to be able to, you know, share the anecdotes and the stories and all that stuff. He went to the New Orleans Saints and he was able to, you know, try to make that uh, trade for Ricky Williams, where he basically traded just about an entire draft to get the running back. And unfortunately, that didn't work. But, I mean, he was such an institution and so popular. I mean, really, when you look at Mike Ditka, he's one of the most popular guys in a popular sport and he's still identified for all the great things that he did for Chicago football both as a player and as a coach and we get a chance to catch up with him and get you the Mike Ditka story that's coming up with Schooled with the Professor.
we are pleased to be joined by Mike Ditka. And Mike, I mean, I guess the first thing is because, you know, we grew up pretty much in the same towns. I mean, you're Aliquippa, I'm Braddock, PA, uh, steelworking type of town. What was it like for you coming out as a football player from Aliquippa and kind of establishing what your career was going to be like? Well, you never have an idea what it's going to be like, John. You play the game because you love the game. I played the game in high school and, and I, I, with no no aspirations of ever going to college uh, because I played the game. But I was good enough to get college scholarships and I went to the University of Pittsburgh with no intention of going into pro football. And then I was good enough, so I got into pro football. And, uh, you know, and, and that's the way it was. I, I played the game because I loved the game. It was uh, it was always a challenge. But we came from an area, John, and you know this. There wasn't much there. You know, when the mills closed down, that by my town right now, Aliquippa is really like a ghost town. It's really, really, uh, really poverty stricken. There's not much going on. So, but when we grew up in the '40s and '50s, I mean, that was booming. The steel mills were booming. It was a great community to grow up in, and uh, and it, the competition in, in the area I grew up in, just like uh, Charlotte, or Manesson, or, or anywhere else, was was terrific. And and a lot of those kids, because of football or because of baseball or basketball, got an opportunity to go to college. And that was the most important thing. Because our parents couldn't afford to send us. And that's the one thing I know that I valued growing up in Braddock because, I mean, again, steel mill town, all the steel mills were closed and all that stuff. And, I mean, we were number one in violent crime. But what it did, it gave you an appreciation that you have to work hard to get anywhere because, I mean, nothing's going to be given to you because, you know, it's a, it's a struggle. And uh, I know I, I value it because, I mean, I lived in Forest Hills, but I always say, where are you from? I'm from Braddock, PA. I was proud of it, yeah. even though that was number one in violent crime. And it was tough, as you know what it was like in Aliquippa. Well, you know, the only thing we're guaranteed in life is an opportunity. We, we, if we, you're given a gift of life and you're given a gift of a healthy life, and what you do with that's totally up to you. No, I'm, I'm not entitled to anybody giving me anything. I get what I achieve. I get what I work for. I get what I earn. And that's the way I was brought up, and, and, and that's what I really believe. I believe that's the American dream. You have an opportunity, and then you make a success of yourself by doing what you love to do, for the fact that you love it, and, and then you work at it, and you have some success. That, that's all life is, you know. You know, it, it, it's to me, it's very simple. Just appreciate what you have and enjoy it. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, I think you may be more than just about any other player I've watched through the years showed that on the field. Because, I mean, how physical you were, how you gave everything in every play. I mean, that ethic was there in everything you do, and it also showed how much you love the game. Well, I think it's also, I mean, I it, I think it's because I love the game, but it was my appreciation for playing, being able to play the game. I think I being have, I have that opportunity. My job was to go out there and win and play the best I could and beat the opponent. Now, fair and square within the rules of the game, and I never went outside the rules of the game. But I tell you what, in football, and, and if you don't like it, I mean, it, it, the fact is you're going to get hit hard. And the guy that hits the hardest, it's probably going to win most of those battles. It's a lot like boxing. So, I mean, if you, if you, uh, if you can take a blow and give a blow and be on the, uh, uh, the giving end and be more successful, you're probably going to win the, win the battle. And you're going to get that other guy's respect, that's for sure. How much different now from the physical side was the game when you played it compared to where it is now? Well, it's bigger, faster, stronger, John. And guys are bigger, faster, stronger. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Are they better than some of the guys that played in our area? I don't know. Are these quarterbacks better than Unitas? I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, they're awfully good. Uh, the game has changed. It's evolved into a passing game more, more or less. Uh, uh, sometimes tackling is a lost art, but, uh, it, it, it's, it's a great game. I love the game. I love to watch the game. The game has been my whole life. Uh, these players are I don't know that they're more talented, but they are bigger, faster, stronger. That, that's all I can tell you. And as a, re- as a result of that, when they collide, the collisions probably are a little bit greater than we had. But the one thing I know uh, back back in your day is, of course, I mean, you never came off the field. I mean, I, I mean, you do have guys that do that now, but you had situation substitutions now, and you have packages and things like that. I mean, it back in your day was just physical, but. Uh, you just go right at it, and nobody flinched. I mean, it's like, hey, you play hurt, don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, we 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 did. You know, we were making a lot of money back in those days, about fifteen thousand a year. We thought that was a big deal, so we went out there and we we laid it on the line. You're right. Nobody wanted to come off when they were injured, 
I mean, it, 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 it's really, when you think about it, it was kind of crazy, but uh, I can't tell you how many games I should have came out of. I never came out of. And you know what? I'm glad I didn't. You know, I had four hip replacements to show for, but so what? I mean, I enjoyed it. It was fun, and it was my life, and I have a right to do what I want to do with it. And, you know, I'm still, like I said, I'm still walking around. What was your favorite moment in football? Well, I probably had a lot of them. I did. I, I mean, I, I can think back to the 63 championship. Uh, when we won the championship in Chicago in 1960, don't forget, that was the year of Lombardi and the Packers. And uh, and the Colts came right after that. And so we, we snuck one in there, and we were really a good football team. Uh, you know, we, uh, we did all the things we're supposed to do. Uh, the next year, we had two of our players got killed in a car accident at training camp, winning Gallimore and, and uh, Bo Farrington. And uh, we weren't the same team again in, in 60, in, in, because we could have been that good in 64, too. But uh, I think probably there's a lot of thrills, man. I, 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 I my, uh, my life changed when I went to Dallas and played for Tom Landry. You know, I won a Super Bowl there as a player and assistant coach and uh and then I, I guess the icing on the cake is when you were hired in Dallas, and I was hired in Dallas, and Coach Landry told, or Coach uh, Hallis told me, uh, I'm hiring you because I want to ch- bring a championship back to Dallas. And uh, we did it. We had a great group of guys. We had a great management team with Jerry Venisi and uh, Bill Tobin, and, 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 we, we, and we just had a great group of guys. You know, it was like I didn't reinvent the wheel. When I got there, a lot of it was there. But the other pieces that weren't there, we put in place, and we end up with a pretty darn good football team for a couple of years. So uh, I think the, the the '85 championship would be the biggest thrill, football wise, in my career. Yeah, and of course, I mean, uh, what was it as far as because you know, you, you, as a tight end, I mean, you played ferociously, and you kind of took the tight end position to a new level. You know, when you went as a coach and then took over the Bears and you know built that thing up. I mean, you built one of the greatest defenses in the history of the league, if not the greatest defense. Well, I, I didn't build that. Like I said, when I got there, a lot of it was there. Buddy Ryan is the, is the reason we had a great defense. He, uh, he he was the architect of that, and, and, you know, he had a design for defense where it was strictly attacked. There was no pull-up mode. He was in an attack mode all the time. And we had the personnel to do it. And people didn't really understand what the 46 defense was, so they didn't know how to prepare for it. The only one that understood it was a guy named Shula down in Miami. And he said, you can't block all these guys. So that what we're going to do is we're going to spread it out. We're going to open it up. We're going to put three receivers in. We're going to move a guy out of it. And, and so then, then we can tell who's coming and who's not coming. And, that, and that's how people did that. That's why the 46, you can't play it today because of the formations. And, and, and Don was the first one that ever did that, really. Yeah, but the one thing that was great is, I mean, you set an environment for the players that was so so good. I mean, because, I mean, the accountability had to be there. You had a lot of personalities. You were able to at least keep everybody in check somehow, some way. But that was the amazing part. I mean, how did you do that? Well, I, I think they understood what the parameters were. We wanted to have fun playing the game, but you want to respect the game always. Uh, you know, it, it, the game of football is not about calling attention to yourself. It's for what the team can accomplish as a whole. Uh, the whole is always greater than the individual. Now, yeah, you need great individuals. I had Walter Payton. I had a great, great defensive players all over, Singletary and Hampton and, and mm-hmm. Fensick. And, and I, but the whole is always greater than the part to me. And it takes a lot of good parts to make the whole. There's no question about it. But we were good because we were good in every area. We were good on special teams. I had a great punter. I had a great kicker. I mean, we, we did – I learned under Coach Lander, you can't just be good on one side of the ball. You've got to be good on both sides of the ball. Yeah, our offense never got the credit it deserved, but that's fine. But we led the league in time of possession, first downs. We led the league in scoring. A lot of that was because of our defense. So when you think about it, it's a combination of what everybody can add to give to the football team. And and, and listen, I, I, I wouldn't trade that group of guys for anybody anywhere in the world. But the great part, too, is that, uh, you know, you talk about an area, a community. I mean, I don't think any coach fit Chicago better than Mike Ditka, maybe in any sport. I mean, you just fit, I mean, as a player, you fit Western Pennsylvania. I mean, that's what that's what came out of Western mm-hmm. Pennsylvania. Obviously, I wasn't a player, so I just just try to work in the business and uh, cover. But it's like, I mean, you fit what a player out of Western Pennsylvania was supposed to be like. And for Chicago, I mean, you were the identity of that town. Well, I, you know, I think it. 
I think that that George, when Coach Hallis hired me, he he knew that I was a bear through and through. And uh, even though I left there, you know, he got rid of me after six years, and uh, I went to Dallas. And and I think that my career, in my mind, and my maturing process, uh, really elevated when I went to Dallas. And I met a great man, and and I, I got a chance to learn the game of football and the game of life, both from Tom Landry. And and that meant all the that meant everything to me, and it changed my life. And when Mr. Uh, I mean, I can remember when Coach Hallis called me in when I was an assistant coach there, and he said, "I, I uh, I, you know, how are you doing? I'm, I said, fine. He said, you know, he said, I had a call from George Hallis. He said, I, I said, oh, that's great, Coach. How, how's he doing? He said, he's fine. He said, I, I think he wants to hire you. You know, and, and that's what he told me. And I said, well, wow. Well, and then I asked him this question. I said, Coach, am I ready? He said, you're ready. And that was it. That was it. I never looked back. I didn't know if I was ready or not. I knew what I was going to do, though. I knew the kind of football team I wanted to have. I wanted. To, I, I knew the way I wanted people to uh, look at the Chicago Bears. Now, it, people say, "Well, that's wrong," or "That's the no." It, it, that's who I was. I was a bear, and I wanted to. I wanted to repay the confidence that the, the guy who started football, in my opinion, uh, had in me. If you would describe what a bear was, what is it? From uh, a I think player? now it's it's a lot of different things, but I I. I I, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you got to understand that we I played against Lombardi's teams. You understand? Mm-hmm. I mean, I played against, uh, uh, I mean, so many great football players in the history of the game are now Hall of Famers and probably a lot of them who should be Hall of Famers. But when you're playing against, uh, uh, say, a Lombardi team, and the Packers are the Packers, and you're the Bears, and that's the biggest rivalry in football, and you go nose-to-nose twice a year, once up there, once in Chicago, and you understand what that rivalry is all about, what the game of football is all about. It's more, it, well, it, it, I, I think it's even more than winning games. It, it's, it's a fact that you're beating somebody. That I mean, how, first thing Hallis said when I met him, uh, you know, he said, we play the Packers twice a year and we want to win those two games. Well, it wasn't the first thing, but he, he said that. And, and it, it, Packer week, when I was with the, the Bears as a player, was in, incredible because he always thought somebody was going to spy on us. You know, we practiced right in Wrigley Field. So he had he had people around the on the uh, walls and everything making sure nobody was was spying on us. He he was he was a little crazy about that stuff. And finally, what was your favorite memory of a Chicago uh, Green Bay rivalry? Oh, I I don't know. I there was so many of them. I had so much respect for those guys uh and I played against Nisky now. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. Now, no one was tougher than Ray Nisky. Nobody was tougher than Ray Nisky. And he tried to kill me about 20 times. You know, And, and uh, so we, we had a great rivalry. But I really believe the rivalry was based on respect more than anything else. And, uh, you know, of course, playing against Horning and Taylor and Bart Starr and McGee and, and, and uh, Dollar and Kramer. And I can name them all almost, you know, Fuzzy. Uh, and they, they were just, just great, great football players. And, uh, and you can see why they were a great team, but they were led by a great man. And, uh, I, I think probably the greatest thrills I had were playing against the, uh, the Packers in, in my early career with the Bears. Mike, uh, of course, it's so great to, to talk to you. And again, uh, from a guy from Braddock to a great success story from Aliquippa. Thanks for joining me. Okay, John. Thank you. God bless you. everyone it's time to ask the professor that's because i'm not a penniless hippie welcome back to schooled with a professor remember each week you get a chance to ask me any question you have relating to the podcast just get on twitter and use the hashtag clayton schooled this week we talked to mike ditka and our question comes from brandon who asked what is the biggest difference in the nfl now than when ditka played and is it for the better or worse Well, I guess you can probably say the fact that quarterbacks are so much more involved and important. That's the biggest difference in the game. It's a quarterback-driven league where back in the day when Mike Ditka was there, it was a running defensive league. I mean, of course, you know, that's where the idea came, defense wins championships. And I guess you can say last year when the Denver Broncos, you know, with bad quarterback play down the stretch, were able to 
go to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. Defense won that championship, but that really hasn't been the case for so many years because I mean, whether it's Peyton Manning or Tom Brady or Ben Roethlisberger or a quarterback, it's usually a defense can get you to the Super Bowl, but it's the quarterback that can win the Super Bowl. Give you the example. It's like you look at the, uh, you know, the two times that the New England Patriots played the New York Giants. I mean, it was big plays down the stretch by Eli Manning uh, in key critical parts of the fourth quarter. That's where the really big difference is because, I mean, you really did not have the type of drills and no huddle type of offenses that are there now. And, you know, the game was so simple. I mean, very simple back in the Mike Ditka days because you didn't have situation substitutions. You didn't have nickel defenses. I mean, basically, you know, the idea of a third cornerback really wasn't there because you weren't going to go with three wide receivers. I mean, you were going to take a fullback or you're going to go two tight end or you're going to go two receivers and they were just going to try to pound the ball. Yeah, naturally, if you had a better chance to win, if you had a better quarterback, but that was a time when, you know, a quarterback would come in and be drafted in the first round, and you wouldn't see him for three years. I mean, you're developing him. There wasn't free agency that could take the quarterback away, so you knew that you had the luxury if you had a quarterback, wait until the older quarterback is done, and then you put the new young quarterback in. But players, I mean, the teams had controls of players for so many years. But now where the game has changed, I mean, it's not more finesse, Maybe to a degree it is than it was in the Mike Ditka days. But now, I mean, you're seeing three and four receiver sets. You're seeing hurry-up offenses where they get the ball off every 20, 25 seconds. You're seeing you know, changes that uh, you wouldn't have seen because, I mean, it was pretty much just run the football, you know, let's give the ball to John Riggins. We're going to give the ball to Larry Zonka. Going to give the ball to Franco Harris or Earl Campbell. And then, of course, then you try to see who had the toughest defense to be able to stop those guys. I mean, you would go through, again, I still remember covering games where the start quarterback would throw between 9 and 12 passes. I mean, now you see games where they're going to have 9 and 12 passes in a possession. I mean, that's just the way the game is. And I think that's the biggest difference. And so in some ways, and, and where it's probably for the better, is that it make it creates more offense. And say what you want. I mean, there's people like myself and old school type of people that love defensive play, but also the general fan likes offense. And you can see the growth of offense and fantasy football, just in the way that the fans relate to that. And it gives you something to do as far as that goes where, I mean, you look in baseball until this year, one of my biggest criticisms was it was so pitcher dominated and the hitters weren't getting anything and there's no offense. I mean, you see that in college basketball right now, you know, because of the way that they can, you know, do the scouting and analytics and stuff like that. They can put players in better position to have lower scoring type of games. I mean, offense is more score is, is more exciting. And so that's where the excitement I think has continued to grow. I mean, you know, you're able to see, you know, a great quarterback like a Russell Wilson or a Cam Newton having a great quarterback. I mean, how many times was it great being able to watch a Tom Brady or a Peyton Manning getting those fourth quarter drives back and back against each other and whoever had the ball last was going to win the football game. Well, I mean, that's before that. It was just in the old days with Mike Ditka. It was just kind of pounded. The quarterbacks may have a chance. I mean, Johnny Unitas kind of started bringing that uh, type of fourth quarter drive and some of that stuff that was able to get the two minute drill and that he was able to do it. But that how long did that take for, for that to happen? I mean, again, physical play was the Mike Ditka era. And that was great football. I mean, it was fun to watch. I mean, you knew that I mean, people were just pounding each other. Now, with the quarterback play and the way it is, and that's why it's so different. I mean, again, with the scheming. I mean, coaches now have more involvement with the game. Before then, the playbooks were smaller. Uh, the hitting was more intense. But now, I think what you see is a different version of the game where creativity is going to be important. Adjustments are going to be important. Figuring out the right way to be able to stop guys is always going to be important. All those things come into play now. So it's a different type of game but it's still a great game it's still football and even though you know mike Ditka, of course was the old school type he still loves the current game and why does he love the current game because it is football and it's a great sport and it's one that we follow and it's one we continue to talk about here every week that's it for this week's edition of schooled you can follow me on twitter at clayton espn and send me your nfl questions with hashtag Clayton Schooled for a chance to get your questions on the air and on the podcast. If you have a minute, please let's have a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Class dismissed. Dismissed.